Hello and welcome to this Stop Frost Maths video on Key Stage 5 Differentiation by First Principles. Now in the video on the gradient function, we saw that the gradient function was an expression for working out the gradient dependent on the value of x. So for example, if I had a sketch of y equals x squared like this, then if I wanted to say find the gradient of the curve uh, when say x was equal to 2, then what I do from, say, GCSE, I would find the tangent of the curve at that point, and then you could use two points on this line, do change y over change x, to get the gradient of this line. And that will give you the gradient of the tangent at this point. Now, it turns out the gradient when x equals 2 is 4. And if I chose a different point, let's just say I chose when x is equal to minus 3 then the gradient of that tangent there would turn out to be minus 6. Clearly, the gradient is changing as you look at different points of this curve. It's only if you had a straight line that the gradient would be fixed. And we can see for this particular curve that the gradient is always double whatever the x value is. So if we took the gradient when x is 0, double 0 is 0. And we can see the gradient indeed is 0 at that point because it's completely horizontal. Whereas if we had a large x value, let's say x is 10, the gradient would be 20. And that makes sense because the gradient is going to get gradually steeper as x increases. And we call that the gradient function. So if y was equal to x squared, we use dy over dx to express the gradient function. And in this case, the gradient function is twice whatever x is. The gradient was twice whatever x is, so it's 2x. Now, we'll see in this video how we can prove that the gradient function is 2x if the function was x squared, or for other functions as well. And this is how we're going to do it. Let's look at a piece of this curve, y equals x squared, again. And let's just say we want to find the gradient for a particular value of x. So we've got a point where the x is x, and the y value would be x squared, because y equals x squared. Now, if we wanted to find the gradient of this tangent, one way we could do it is to find a point that was close by and then literally just do change in y over change in x to find the gradient between those two close by points. And provided that point is sufficiently close to this point here, x, y, then that gradient is going to be very similar to the gradient of the tangent at this point here. So let's say this is just some small distance away. So the x value, we're just going to make h bigger. So it's just h up the x-axis. And then, well, the y value is equal to x squared. So the y value is equal to this x value squared. So it'd be x plus h squared. And I recommend when you're doing any differentiation by first principles question, you draw a little diagram like this with your original point and the point that's close by where you've added h to the x value. So how would we find the gradient here? Well, we know we can just do change in y over change in x. So what is the change in the y value? Well, we can just do that y value minus that y value. And what's the change in x value from x to x plus h? Well, x plus h minus x is just going to be h. We said that h was the difference between these two x values. Now, we want this point to be as close as possible to this, because if I chose a point which was far away and found the gradient between this original point and this other point, we can see that that gradient doesn't resemble this gradient of the tangent here. So we, see, we can see that that other point, the second point, has to be close to the first point. So we want h to be as small as possible. And we have some new notation for this, the limit as h tends towards 0. So what this does is to find the limit of this expression. What does this expression become as h tends towards 0, i.e. the gap between these two points becomes increasingly small. And that is going to give us our gradient function. So now let's just kind of expand this out and see if this simplifies nicely. So let's make sure we still write this limit thing here. Expand that out, we get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared over h. We can see that those x squared terms cancel. And then we can divide each of these two terms by the h. So that's going to give us 2xh over h, which is just 2x, 
plus h squared over h, which is just h. Now let's consider the limit of this expression as h tends towards zero. If h becomes really, really small, that plus h term effectively disappears. We've got 2x plus a really small number. We can just call that 2x because this is effectively becoming zero. So we're left with 2x. And indeed, that's what we expected. We knew that the gradient function when y is equal to x squared was 2x. So we've indeed solved this first question here. Show by first principles that if y equals x squared, then dy of dx equals 2x. And this technique that we used of using the limit and considering two points which are close by is known as differentiation by first principles. So let's do the second question here. Uh, the point 416, called A, lies on the curve y equals x squared. The gradient at A is g. Show that g is equal to the limit of x plus h, as h tends towards 0. So let's just draw a little diagram again. I always do the diagram for this type of question. We've got the point 416, and we want the gradient at this particular point. And we're going to find that by considering this point close by and the gradient between those two points. So again, we just add a small value to the x, so that 4 plus a small value h, and y is equal to x squared, so y is equal to that x value squared, it's 4 plus h squared. And then we do exactly what we did before. So the gradient, in this case, it's referring to as g. Make sure you use the notation in the question. So rather than dy of dx, we're referring to that specific gradient at that point as the constant g. So g is equal to the limit as h tends towards 0 of the change in the y value, so this y value minus this y value, over the change in x, which is always going to be h for this type of question. Then we just expand out and simplify as we did before. So that's going to become 16 plus 8h plus h squared minus 16 over h. The 16s cancel, just like the, just like the x squareds cancelled before. And then we've got 8h over h, which is equal to 8 plus h squared over h, which is h. And the limit of that as h tends towards 0, which is exactly what we wanted there. And then in part b, hence deduce the value of g. Well, that's what we did at this last step here. Well, if h tends towards 0, that term effectively disappears, so we just get 8 as the answer. So the gradient uh, of y equals x squared when x is 4 is just 8, which we expect because the gradient on y equals x squared is just double whatever the x value is, so double 4 is 8. Now these ones are algebraically harder. We want to show that 2x cubed differentiates to 6x squared. You may not have seen this notation before, but this is a function. This just says when we differentiate this to get the gradient function, it gives us 6x squared. So I'm just going to write y equals 2x cubed, and we have to prove that the gradient function is 6x squared. So as always, I'm going to just draw a little diagram. The original point is when we have an x value of x, and the y value is 2x cubed, and then we're going to consider a point close by to this. So we're going to have x plus h as always, and then the y value is 2 times that x value cubed. So that x value cubed, 2 times x plus h cubed. And then, as always, we do the change in y over change in x to find the gradient between those two points. So dy of dx is the limit as h tends towards 0 of the change in y that minus that, over the change in x, which is h as always. And then this is going to require some more hefty expansion. You may have done binomial expansion. Now you could just write this bracket out three times, so x plus h times x plus h plus x plus h. But if you've done binomial expansion, this will be a bit easier. So I'm just going to expand it in my head. That's x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed, and we're going to have to times that by 2 in a second, minus the 2x cubed, all over h. And then let's just expand that out. We get 2x cubed plus 6x squared h plus 6x h squared plus 2h cubed minus 2x cubed, all over h. And then let's see what cancels. The 2x cubed terms cancel. 
And then each of these terms we can divide by h. So that just becomes 6x squared plus that becomes 6xh. That becomes 2h squared. And it's the limit of this as h tends towards 0. Now, if we just make h 0, we can see that that term is going to be 0, 2 times 0 squared. Now, this is also going to be 0 because we've got 6x times 0. So those two terms get wiped out because we've got a multiplication by h, which is 0. So we're just left with 6x squared, which indeed is what we wanted. And the very last one, and this is uh, in the A2 syllabus. So if you're just doing the first year of your A-level, for example, then you may want to stop the video at this point. But we want to show the gradient function of sine of x is cos of x. So let's do what we do before. We got our initial point x sine x, because y is equal to sine x. And we've got the point x, y. And then we've got some point close by. So we've got x plus h. And we got sine of that x value, this x value here, sine of x plus h. So we do what we did before. dy over dx is the limit as h tends towards 0 of change in y, this y value minus this y value, over the change in x, which is, as always, h. Now, we need to sort of expand it out, but we don't expand this like a normal bracket. It's not sine times x plus h. We have to use something called addition rule. And again, if you've not done the A2 content um, and you haven't seen the addition formula for trigonometric functions, then do stop this video now because this won't make any sense. So I know this off by heart as sine x cos y plus cos x sine y. And then we've got this minus sine x at the end. I've run out of space all over h. And then what we do is we try to get the sine x and cos x terms all together. So, this is sort of the hard bit. How many lots of sine x do we have? Well, we've got cos h over h lots of sine x. And we've also got this minus 1 over h lots of sine x. So we can put this minus 1 at the top. So we've got that lots of sine x. And how many lots of cos of x we got? Well, we got sine y over h lots of cos of x. So we've got plus sine y over, sorry, that should have been sine h. So we've got sine h over h lots of cos x. So we've got all the sine x terms together and all the cos x terms together. And now we can consider what happens as h tends towards zero. Well, we have to use something called small angle approximations here. So when we did some angle approximations, we saw that if h tends towards zero, so h was really small, the angle is really small, then sine h was approximately equal to h, and cos of h was approximately equal to 1 minus half h squared. Then if we sub that in, the cos of h is equal to 1 minus half h squared minus the 1 over h, lots of sine x, plus, and that sine h we said was approximately equal to h, so we've got h over h cos x. Now these ones cancel, 1 minus 1, and we've got minus half h squared over h, which is just minus half h sine x plus cos x. Now as h tends towards 0, we've got h times something, that's just going to be 0. So we're just left with that cos of x here. And we are done.